Hi everyone. Um, so this is a uh, course on ancient Rome, uh, Flagler College. I'm Dr. Young. Um, I uh, <clears throat> wanted to devote this lecture to a discussion of the mental, intellectual, uh, we might say cultural structures of the Roman Republic. If you want to understand Rome, uh, you have to have some comprehension of the concepts that we're going to talk about today. I mean, Rome is not just about uh, political structures, okay? Um, it's really about a mindset, and if you fail to understand that mindset, you're, you're going to go wrong in, in uh, interpreting primary sources and making sense of Roman history. And so that's what this lecture is devoted to. Um, each of these concepts we could spend a lot of time on. Uh, I will try to keep this as simple as, uh, as I can. There is a good discussion of all of these things in, um, in the uh, Thomas Africa textbook, which is one of the reasons actually why I like this textbook. It really delves into detail on these things, um, which I think are tremendously important. Uh, and so, you know, I, I want you to keep these things in mind. Um, this week's uh, primary source reading is um, uh, the Plautus and Terence plays. Um, and even though uh, plays, kind of Greek-style comedies uh, like Plautus and Terence wrote, were imports from the Greek world, they still capture uh, much of the Roman mindset of the Republican period, the 3rd and 2nd centuries when Plautus and Terence were writing, uh, respectively. Um, and, uh, you know, they're set... Um, in Athens because they're comedies and that was the conventional place to, to set them. Uh, and, you know, to some extent that allows the playwrights to distance the Romans from uh, what goes on in, in the uh, comedy. Uh, but at the same time, they do reveal a great deal um, about the values that the Romans held dear. And so, you know, uh, I would encourage you to keep this lecture in mind as you look at those plays, as you read them. Uh, and try to make sense of them and, and write a paper about them. Well, I want to start with a quote that, that actually this is from the Thomas Africa book. Um, I can't remember who the quote was by. Uh, um, gosh, okay, well, <laughs> uh, in any case, um, uh, sorry about that. But the, the quote uh, reads in Latin, Moribus antiquis res stat romana uh, virisque. Um, and so let me take you through the Latin here a little bit. All right, race, uh, we mentioned, I mentioned in the last lecture, this is the word for, it just means thing. Uh, but when you see race in something like this, it's modified by the adjective Romana. So the Roman thing, and by that we mean the Republic, uh, stands, stat, um, because of, this is in the ablative case, which we don't need to go into a Latin lesson here, but... Uh, so the Roman Republic stands because of ancient customs, moribus antiquis, and real men. Now the word here for man is the word vir. There are actually a couple different words for man, uh, uh, a kind of generic one, but then one that very much refers to masculine uh, human beings, okay? Um, uh, so the generic word for man, meaning kind of mankind or humankind, uh, is the word homo. Uh, and we'll encounter that uh, later on um, in, in certain usages. But the word vir, or weir, uh, as it would have been pronounced in classical times, uh, V-I-R, connotes um, masculinity, right? And, and everything that goes along with kind of hyper-masculinity. Uh, courage and uh, uh, battlefield prowess and, you know, um, the, the, the potency, the virile potency uh, of a manly man, uh, so to speak, right? And, and the Romans really kind of prize that. Um, and a lot of their values are connected to this, to this notion. Um, we find the word uh, virtue used often. Uh, it's used in these plays. I actually want to look at uh, an example from Plautus a bit later on uh, about this. Um, the word virtue has changed significantly in meaning over time. Um, virtue has been co-opted by the kind of Judeo-Christian tradition to mean something like uh, sexual morality, right? Uh, one who is virtuous um, 
is clean of the, you know, in, in sort of the Christian terms, the taint of, uh, uh, of sexual promiscuity. Um, but that's not what it meant at all in ancient Rome. The word virtus, uh, where we get the, the English word virtue, meant manliness or courage. And so the Romans really, uh, you know, they prize this masculinity, and, and that's something connected to a lot of these other virtues that we want to discuss here. Okay, now, we're going to give the Latin concepts and then uh, sort of go through them, explain what they mean. Uh, the first of these is the word fides. Fides is usually translated uh, into English with either the word faith or the word loyalty. Um, uh, I suppose we could put something like trustworthiness or integrity or something like that in there. Uh, faith, or fides in this case, is not faith as in a religious sense. That's actually the next one, which is pietas. So I'll come to that uh, in a moment. Um, uh, fides meant more like loyalty. Uh, the um, uh, One's integrity with rel uh, relev relative to uh, one's commitment to greater things, to one's family, uh, to one's society, to the government, or the, well, the, the, the Roman word patria, the fatherland, right? One expressed uh, fides, or loyalty, to the patria. Um, and uh, in trying to understand the origins of this concept of fides, one must recognize that the Roman economy uh, from the earliest days of the Republic was an agricultural one and that uh, a lot of the Roman identity was bound up in the working of land. Uh, the Romans considered themselves, even at the height of their empire, as kind of country bumpkins who made good but retained their identity, their kind of earthiness of their origins, right? Um, uh, and so there was a lot of um, uh, loyalty bound up to the land, um, to the territory of Rome and its surrounding environs. Um, you know, these were all a component of the fides, uh, that, you know, to be a good Roman, one had to be a farmer, had to exercise good um, judgment and, and good um, uh, responsibility relative to the lands one possessed. Um, so that's a component of fides. Uh, uh, had to be a good steward of everything that was within their stewardship. Um, so that's, you know, that's part of what, and this, you know, this sort of goes both ways. One would express fides uh, relative to the, the people one had stewardship, stewardship over, meaning uh, one's family members. Um, you know, uh, a Roman man would have fides toward his wife and his children and his servants and his slaves, uh, sort of looking, you know, the, the ones he is over uh, but fides always also extends up, that uh, a Roman man would also um, uh, have fides to his patrons, for instance. And I'll talk about patronage and clientage in a, in a couple minutes. Um, but slaves would uh, be expected to have fides to their masters. Um, women would be expected to have fides to their husbands. Children would be expected to express fides to their parents uh, and to their um, older relatives. Right um, Now... Uh, the sense of relations existed kind of along two lines. One of these is the gens. Uh, this is usually translated with the word, with the English word clan. Um, and, you know, going back into the earliest days of Rome, this probably would have meant uh, something akin to a, a kinship group. Um, and it retained that identity. Um, but gens becomes particularly important for patricians who tried to trace their ancestry back to the early years of the Republic um, and, uh, you know, to connect themselves with the greatness of their ancestors uh, as a justification for continuing to have a stranglehold on power. And this is bound up in, in its own way with another concept, uh, which I'll talk about in a couple minutes here, which is dignitas uh, or honos or auctoritas. Um, but we'll come to that in due course here. Uh, and so, you know, one's clan was important, especially the patricians identified with their clan. They, they, the patricians tended to have three names. Um, they had a prinomen, which is their first name. Uh, they had a, all, all Romans had a prinomen. All Romans had a cognomen, which was connected to their tribe or in some cases, to, well, 
uh, there are the origins of um, uh, of the cognomen, the tribe name, are are um, varied. Um, this may have been association with the place they lived, uh, with some profession that uh, their ancestors had done, uh, or with a group uh, of people uh, who had a specific name attached to it. Um, uh, but Roman patricians tended to have a middle name, or just their nomen, uh, which was their gens name, right? Um, and so if we think about the great um, uh, clans of uh, Republican Rome, we may think of the Julii or the Julii, for instance, right, which was the clan of Julius Caesar, um, uh, or the, um, uh, I've got to think here, um, the Licinii, which was the, uh, uh, the, the clan of uh, Marcus Licinius Crassus, um, or, you know, anyway, the, these clans were important, especially for patricians, that's why they tended to have three names, whereas Plebeians might have only had uh, two, uh, a prionomen and a cognomen. Uh, some wealthy plebeians did have a gens name as well. Uh, we might think of the, um, uh, the Sempronii Gracchi, uh, for instance. So Sempronius would have been their, their gens name. And we'll talk about Tiberius and Gaius Gracchus. I've mentioned them already, but we'll go into greater detail about them later. The other line upon which uh, the Romans thought about kinship connections, and, and this one was more immediate, uh, less kind of conceptual, uh, was their familia. Now, familia is where we get the, the English word family, of course, but it did not mean uh, what family tends to mean in the modern day, especially in Western countries, where it's the you know father, mother, children, uh, maybe some connection to extended family, grandparents and aunts and uncles and things like this. Uh, familia was that for the Romans, but it was much broader than that at the same time. It meant a uh, uh, better translation of familia than family would be the household. Okay, And so familia was connected to not only all of the um, close family members who could trace their, uh, well, their um, bloodline connection to each other. And this would include, you know, kind of across several generations, so uh, extended cousins perhaps would all be part of the same familia. And, and each familia almost certainly was uh, different um, in kind of its makeup from every other familia. The, each of these was uh, to some extent sui generis or of its own kind, right? Um, but um, uh, the familia uh, also included the property that the familia held um, and all of the servants and slaves, um, and if the uh, the head of the familia, the pater familias, was a prominent man, he might have clients uh, who would also be considered a kind of extension of the familia. Um, the head of each familia was known as a pa the pater familias. Now that word is difficult to translate into English because we don't really have any kind of cognate or any similar sort of institution. Um, I like to use the word alpha male to, uh, to translate pater familias. Um, uh, if you know something about the mafia, you might use the word godfather or something like that, though that has a dark and sinister connotation to it. Uh, the pater familias legally had life and death power over everyone within his familia. Um, because public law did not interfere in the internal workings of the familia, at least not in most cases. A pater familias, if he wanted to, uh, decided that his own son or his daughter was a, a nincompoop, right? He could uh, have that person exiled, he could have them executed, he could do that himself. Um, he could certainly do this with his slaves or his servants, right? Um, but this isn't just about the power to kill people. Um, that's a, these are, that's an extraordinary cases. The paterfamilias was also responsible for ensuring the marriages, for instance, of all of, um, not only his children, but the, uh, the, the young men and young women, uh, within his familia. Um, he was to be an effective steward over all of this. Uh, and determining who became the paterfamilias was not just a matter of, you know, finding the, the oldest male member of the family, um, each potter familias would um, be responsible for determining an heir, and to do this, he would, you know, settle upon the one he thought would be the most capable, right? Um, and so, to cite a famous example, Julius Caesar more or less designated his uh, nephew and adopted son. Um, he adopted him to kind of uh, 
make the relationship stronger, even though they already had a blood relationship. But, you know, his, his adopted son slash nephew was Octavian, um, who later became Augustus Caesar. Uh, that's a good example of uh, the Potterfamilius uh, settling upon an heir and kind of determining who that would be and, and declaring everyone uh, to everyone that that was going to be the case. The Romans also had this system of patronage and clientage, and this was as strong and as secure and as important for those who were part of it as the system of the familia was, or certainly more than the, more than the gens, uh, definitely. Um, patrons would take on, well, how should we put this, hangers on, okay, um, men who swore their allegiance, their fides, um, to their patron, agreed to do his bidding, and in return the patron was supposed to um, supply them with opportunities to advance in the society, uh, whether that be uh, sorry, political support or, um, you know, uh, positions in, a, in an army or, I mean, there's a, a thousand and one ways that a patron might serve his clients. Uh, the clients were then to do the bidding of the patron, to form voting blocks that, uh, to support uh, the wishes of the patron in something like the Comitia Centuriata or in the Senate um, uh, or, you know, in any of these, uh, even in the Concilium Plebis, perhaps, because some plebeians were taken on as clients by patricians. Um, the most um, obvious patron-client relationships would be between truly prominent patricians. And that, that was not all patricians were cut out of the same cloth, so to speak, at least in the Roman conception. Uh, there were some who were especially prestigious and especially honorable. Um, and so other patricians would uh, attach themselves in these patron-client relationships, uh, but so would plebeians. And this, this system evolved a great deal over time. Um, by the late Republic, we have whole armies uh, sworn to a patron commander, uh, where effectively hundreds or even thousands of men become the clients of a single individual, um, though most of those clients would be you know, in, in, on their own terms, men of relatively low status, plebeians uh, without a lot of clout, to get, when, when put together, uh, if you have an entire army doing the will of the patron, well, that patron wields a great deal of power, right? Um, and this becomes a major, a major factor in uh, the late Republic, one of the things actually that, that precipitate, precipitates the, um, the downfall of the Republic. Uh, the Romans also had a lot of slaves. Um, slaves may have been the majority of the population uh, of Rome at points in its history. Um, and uh, not all slaves were exactly the same, uh, I will say. Um, some of them were quite privileged. Some of them, you know, would be personal attendants of, you know, say the paterfamilias of a really prominent familia or something like that. Others would be really just chattel, right? Uh, working manual labor jobs, doing difficult tasks. Um, uh, slaves were uh, subject to the lustful predations, both men and women, uh, subject to the lustful predations of their masters. Um, uh, they had to do the bidding. Um, Romans did, though, consider their slaves not permanent in the sense of, you know, that they were going to be bound in slavery forever and their condition would never change. Uh, it was a frequent thing for, or a common thing for Romans to manumit their slaves, uh, even to share, say, the profits of their, you know, the slaves' labor with their slaves so that they could save up and buy their freedom. Um, uh, slaves fulfilled a, a number of tasks. Um, we'll talk about entertainment in a moment here, but uh, most, if not just about all gladiators, for instance, were slaves. Um, Though the more prestige they gained, the more that their masters might be willing to share some of the profits uh, of their um, their exploits in the arena with them, so that those gladiators could eventually buy their freedom. Um, we get a sense of the varied nature of slaves in uh, the reading that you had to do for this week. This is the Plautus Haunted House, and you can see something similar in the woman from Andros of Terence. Roman comedies were really just knockoffs of Greek comedies. There are some distinctions that we might make between them, but they had these stock characters. Uh, every Roman comedy had, for instance, a kind of old geezer, a miser, who, uh, whose um, 
lack of interest in doing anything new or or different, you know, was one of the driving forces of the 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 narrative in the play. Uh, every Roman comedy had a young man uh, who was usually involved in some kind of hijinks, uh, often leading a dissolute life. Um, uh, and, you know, the old geezer is, is usually his father who wants him to do something, and the young man, you know, doesn't want to do that. Um, so that's, that's the basis of the narrative. But every Roman comedy at the same time has a clever slave. And if, you know, we're talking about the, the main character of these comedies, it's the slave in almost every case. There's also some, you know, young ingenue uh, woman... Um, uh, who is kind of the love interest of the young nobleman. Um, and so, you know, the, the stock characters um, reinforced these values that we're talking about, especially the value of fides. In the opening scene here, we have this interaction, uh, and this is in the, the haunted house, right? Um, we have this interaction between two slaves. One of them is named Grumio, and he is identified as a country slave meaning he works on the farm of their master, um, Theoproperties. Uh, and he comes into town uh, to the, the urban house of Theoproperties, uh, and he comes across Tronio, um, who is a, as it says here, a city slave of Theoproperties. Now notice that all of these names are Greek Again, you know, this gives the Romans the ability to kind of distance themselves from this action that they're just imitating the Greeks, but, you know, the, the Roman values still come through uh, uh, quite a bit, okay? Um, Tranio is the clever slave. He's the one who, uh, whose hijinks, whose uh, kind of plots and plans and, and ambitions uh, are driving the course of the play, okay? Um, and Grumio encounters him, and he says, you know, it's your fault that uh, all of this um, bad stuff is happening to our master, right? So, um, so you know, let's pick it up down here. You city slicker, wise guy, playboy. And he's talking to another slave here, right? So obviously, Tranio is kind of living the good life along with his uh, with Philolakes, uh, who is the son, kind of the dissolute son, right? Um, and it seems that Tranio is the one who's arranged all of this dissolution for. Uh, for his uh, for his young master, so you city slicker, wise guy, playboy. So you throw the farm up against me, and Tranio's saying here, you know, you're you're a country bumpkin. You don't know anything. Uh, go back to the farm, right? Um, I reckon Tranio, it's because you know he'll be put to work at the grind mill. Very, you'll be put to work at the grind mill very soon. Just a few days more, Tranio, and I'll bet you'll be increasing the population on the farm. Yes, the gang that works in chains. And so these are the slaves uh, who have the lowest reputation to, to the family. These are the troublesome ones who would be given the most loathsome tasks and would often be chained up lest they run away, right? Um, rather than being entrusted with important things like Tranio, it seems, is. Um, right now, while you feel in the mood and have got the opportunity, just drink away, squander the property, Corrupt our young master, such a fine young man. Keep on drinking night and day. Whoop it up. Buy mistresses and set them free. Feed moochers. Eat in high style. Are these the instructions the old man left with you when he went away to foreign lands? Is this how he'll find his property has been taken care of? Is this your idea of the duty of a good slave to ruin his master's property and his son? Grumio thus voices this notion of fides, right? What does the slave owe his master? Well, he owes him loyalty. He's supposed to follow his instructions. In this case, uh, Theopropides has gone off on a journey. He's been involved in business. This, by the way, is something that uh, the Romans themselves would, especially elite Romans, would never have said they did, um, though they did kind of on the sly. Uh, but, you know, since this is a, a Greek character, then, then it's okay to say that, right? The Greeks had a reputation for being... You know, merchants and involved in business and, and all of that. Um, but, you know, the, the fides, the, the expectations of fides of the slave uh, come across here. And Tranio is just like, get out of my life. What is it? What is It's not your business to, to monitor me. You're just a little slave. And, uh, and then, you know, he says to him, may Jupiter and all the gods damn you. Phew, you stink of garlic, you muck pile, rube, billy goat, pigsty, swill and manure all mixed up. 
like this this is I guess name calling it's kind of schoolyard name calling ancient Roman style um, and uh, Grumio's like well uh, you know we can't all have a place of honor at the table or eat such swell foods as you do um, but I know that my good luck is waiting for me eventually but your bad luck's coming for you really soon right um, and Tranio's like well let's just see if I can wriggle out of this and he does I mean repeatedly he comes up with ways of, uh, and what what I find interesting about both of these plays and about every Roman comedy I've ever come across is that the slave usually um, is blamed for everything, right? It's not the fault, according to this, of Philolaches that he has become dissolute, that he, the heir of uh, the house, um, you know, the uh, the kind of the, the dauphin uh, of this... Um, uh, this familia, the heir apparent, right, the one who will later become the paterfamilias, he has become dissolute. Uh, it's because of Tranio's influence. And Tranio's blamed for this. And eventually Tranio kind of gets chained up and sent off by Theopropides, uh, even though, I mean, he might justly say, I'm just a slave. Like, he, he didn't have to follow me. Um, but this, I guess, is the reputation that some slaves had, um, was to take advantage of their masters and to kind of mess things up um, and it was, you know, uh, the responsibility of the master to ensure that his slaves were um, in good order um, and doing their work and all of that, okay. Speaking of which, um, we might mention women here um, and talk about the expectations of women. I didn't mean to, I wasn't comparing women to slaves here, uh, but the primary responsibility, this is the connection, primary responsibility of women was to maintain the household. Now, that said, Roman women did have a great deal more autonomy and uh, uh, even kind of a public role than they did in, say, Greece, um, uh, where that would have been considered unseemly. Roman women um, had some confidence. Uh, they did have recourse to law. Um, and in the private sphere, many Roman women, it's, it's fairly obvious, and there's good evidence for this, uh, exerted a real hold on their husbands. And, and by that means, they dictated... Um, uh, sort of public affairs. Uh, and so we can never discount this. We can't do it in Greece either, uh, but it's especially uh, notable for the Romans. For this reason, the Greeks thought the Romans, you know, were immoral people because their women were just too free. Um, and the Greeks put a lot of stock in kind of the, um, uh, the position that women held in society as an, an indicator of the ethics of that society. Um, so they found the Romans to be uh, rather scandalous in their behavior. Uh, but the woman was expected to bear children, first of all. Um, uh, this is an agricultural society. Infant mortality was fairly high. They need laborers. Uh, they need, you know, young people um, to take on uh, some of the more important tasks as the, uh, the previous generation, the parents and the grandparents get older and are less able to do these things. Uh, and so a good Roman woman, a good Roman matron would have given birth to many children, uh, would have been a f an effective steward of her household, uh, would have been involved in essential household tasks like spinning and weaving, making clothes, uh, which was more labor intensive than any other thing, but also caring for children and, and uh, making sure that the slaves and the servants were doing what they needed to do and not taking advantage of their masters like Tranio does, it seems, uh, in the haunted house um, or... Uh, uh, Davus does in uh, The Woman from Andros, okay? Um, uh, now, noble women did have... Uh, there's some other things that we might say about noble women, but let's wait until we talk about Dignitas for that. Um, Roman entertainments reinforced this value, um, and uh, especially kind of their... The Romans considered themselves rather simple, uh, rustic people uh, who enjoyed uh, earthy things... And forms of entertainment the Romans preferred were quite earthy. Chariot racing was easily the most popular pastime. Um, and, uh, you know, the Romans enjoyed it when the chariots crashed. Um, they had a word for it. I forget the Latin, but the word for it, a crash in a chariot race was a shipwreck, right? Uh, I don't know why they employed that um, uh, metaphor there, but, uh, they, you know, they, they liked that. They liked blood sport. Um, they, you know, for a couple of centuries, third and second centuries, when Plautus and Terence were writing, Greek style comedies were quite were somewhat popular among um, the the nobility, among the patricians, uh, but they fell out of favor quickly. And the Romans liked much more lowbrow stuff, things like pantomime 
and even scandalous displays like burlesque or striptease or things like this. The Romans really went in for that kind of thing. And they didn't see this as unharmonious with their values, right? Because they are simple, earthy, agrarian people in their minds, even when they reach the heights of their sophistication. That said, Romans also did, uh, especially elite Romans, but a fairly decent proportion of the population, had access to some education. Uh, written texts were quite common. Uh, patricians, certainly, and maybe even some wealthy plebeians would have had some books probably written on papyrus, probably in the form of scrolls. Um, uh, the codices would have come later on, uh, meaning the style of books that we have with a spine and bound and things like that. Um, but uh, they had some of these um, manuals for uh, effective maintenance of farms. Uh, these sorts of things were common. The Romans really went in for, for like self-help stuff or what we might call pop psychology, right? So these are the sorts of things the Romans enjoyed reading. Uh, and writing, for that matter. Um, less highbrow stuff, uh, though, you know, with the reign of Augustus, we do see the kind of golden age of Roman culture. That was not what Romans commonly would have gone for in their reading choices. Okay, uh, I spent a lot of time on Fides. This, this one probably is going to, that one took the most time because there's a lot connected to that. Pietas is a little more simple. Uh, this means piety. Uh, and, and it, with, with a connection to religion here, for the most part, okay? Um, uh, and we could go into great detail about this, too. I, I'm going to try to refrain from doing that, though I do find this aspect of Roman culture quite fascinating. Um, uh, pietas did not mean piety in the sense uh, of, uh, say, a piety in an Abrahamic monotheistic religion um, where one has a personal connection to God's uh, or to to a single god, I should say, um, and uh, devotes oneself, you know, to kind of personal connection through prayer or through reading sacred texts or something like that. Um, uh, pietas for Romans, as for Greeks, um, was a matter of doing the right rituals, um, performing the rote uh, rites that. Uh, they were expected to do. Um, and uh, Roman conceptions of gods were quite complex. Um, in the earliest years of the Roman existence, meaning all the way back into the period of the kingdom or even before that, um, they seem to have started out with these agrarian cults. This is not surprising given that the Romans were agricultural people. This is common all over Europe. Uh, these agrarian deities did not take anthropomorphic form. Uh, rather, they were impersonal forces of nature and the Romans were expected to, uh, to praise them and venerate them through rituals. Um, and so they would do this. They, you know, as they headed out to plow their farms, they would, uh, uh, perform certain rituals to draw the favor of the gods to ensure that the planting would go well and that there would eventually be a good harvest. Um, and so, you know, this is, this is pretty common everywhere we find uh, agriculture as the basis of society. Um, so it's not surprising, uh, but, you know, that's, that's where the Romans start. Uh, via the Etruscans and the Greeks... The Romans started to, uh, probably in the period of the kingdom or maybe a little before that, um, the Romans started to worship anthropomorphic deities where their gods took human form. Often these were gods borrowed from uh, other peoples or at least modified in some form. Um, as agrarian peoples, you would expect that they had agricultural gods like Mars, who was also, of course, a god of war. Uh, but also sky gods, ensuring good weather, and that would be Jupiter, um, the, the king of the gods, right? Um, now, the, the form that Jupiter would eventually take was influenced heavily by the Greek uh, conception of Zeus, um, but the Romans did have a sky god before this, and, and in fact, in all Indo-European cultures, that seems to be the chief god. We find this among the Celts and among the German peoples and others as well. Uh, in addition to those, we have a couple of other deities that go back to the very early period of uh, uh, the Roman Republic, if not before that, um, uh, and remain important all through Roman history. Um, I didn't put Minerva on here, but she uh, is an important goddess uh, associated with the city of Rome itself. Um, there's a temple to Minerva really early on. At least we have some evidence of that. Um, uh, though, you know, she was not... Um, 
the exact equivalent of uh, the Athena of, you know, the Odyssey or something like that. This is a different deity. They later get merged to some extent, uh, Athena and, and Minerva. Um, but specifically Roman gods, uh, Janus or Janus, actually is how that would be pronounced, um, was a god with two faces. And Janus was the god they appealed to when they came to important decisions, where they could go one way or the other. Uh, Janus was associated with new beginnings um, and major crossroads in one's life. Uh, there was a temple to Janus uh, that uh, the gates of which were shut if Rome was at peace. Uh, if they were open, that meant that Rome was at war. Um, the gates of Jan, the Janus Temple were open far more than they were closed in the Republican period, as we'll see later on. Um, but Janus is a, a, a god that goes way back uh, to the very earliest uh, layers of Roman history, uh, even to prehistoric times, it seems. Um, the other, and this one's a goddess, the other deity uh, of kind of everyday importance to the Romans was Vesta. Vesta is similar in some ways to the Greek goddess Hestia, uh, who was the goddess of the hearth um, and is one of the uh, the children of the Titan. Um, uh, oh gosh, just had a... Kronos. <laughs> just had a, a, a brain lapse there for a second. Um, uh, but th this, is, this is a uniquely Roman thing, and it never... I mean, it may be influenced by Hestia later on, but uh, Vesta's not a goddess that is kind of out there in your face, you know, with, uh, with big temples or anything like that. Um, uh, the Romans, uh, did have a city hearth, like most cities, a kind of city square with a fire burning. Uh, and this was in celebration of Vesta. And, uh, the fire itself was attended by six patrician women who had to be virgins. Uh, if it became obvious that one of the Vestal Virgins was not, in fact, a virgin, then that would cause a public scandal. Um, you know, we see this in the uh, the founding, one of the founding myths of Rome, that uh, one of the, a Vestal Virgin becomes pregnant um, and uh, gives birth to Romulus and Rima. She claimed to have been impregnated by the god Mars. Um, and, you know, the, but that still causes a public scandal, and she is killed, but the children are preserved. Um, uh, and go on to found the city, right? So there's some kind of contradictions in this. Uh, to be a Vestal Virgin meant that one uh, was a 30-year commitment. And so patrician women were not exactly clamoring to do this because it meant that they sacrificed the majority of their lives to this single task. By the time they finished this, they would be in middle age, well past their prime, um, uh, and probably have few prospects for you know living an, a normal life after that. Um, uh, but Vestal Virgins were among the more sacred individuals in all of Rome. As time went on and Rome uh, became more and more intertwined with other peoples of the Mediterranean, they gradually adopted other cults, uh, the Olympian cults of the Greeks. Uh, there was a lot of worship of the god Apollo uh, in Rome as there was in Greece. Um, things like the, uh, the Temple at Cume, the Temple of Apollo at Cume with the Sibyl there. Uh, this was a celebrated institution for the Romans, as it was for Greeks uh, in Magna Graecia. The Romans sent uh, people to that temple, and to Delphi, for that matter, to consult with the oracles of Apollo. Um, so Apollo was quite popular, and, and there were other deities as well that, that assumed uh, a role. Um, Juno, uh, it seems, was originally an Etruscan deity associated with the city of Veii. Uh, and when the Romans uh, defeated Veii in the early 5th century, they sort of... Um, stole the goddess Juno, or uh, appealed to her to come and be part of Rome, um, and according to their understanding, she had done this. She had abandoned the, the Etruscans there um, and become a Roman deity. Um, there were also minor deities, and these aren't necessarily named. Uh, they're lumped together under these kind of categories. Uh, the Lares, as the Romans knew them, were the gods and goddesses of the field um, and of nature. And the Penates were the gods and goddesses of the household. Each household had its own unique conceptions of these things. Um, or at least within each gens or something like that. They had their own system of worship, right? So there was a great deal of variety um, in Rome. Um, it was the responsibility of the pater familias 
to observe the rituals within the familia, to appeal to the lares and the penates, uh, and to perform other rituals. The Romans believed in ghosts, and there were rituals, you know, sort of uh, kind of like Halloween, where they thought that, that all of the ghosts of their ancestors were present and, and, and possibly meant them harm, and so they would do things to try to mitigate the harm that those... Uh, those ghosts might cause um, the the supernatural world or the worlds uh, of the deceased was present constantly in the Roman imagination. There were also priests in various priesthoods within Rome and priestesses for that matter. Uh, so each deity had its own temples staffed by priests and priestesses. Um, there were state uh, religious authorities. Uh, the most prominent of these was the Pontifex Maximus, meaning the greatest of uh, all the priests. That's kind of what that means. Uh, the Pontifex Maximus was an elected official of the Roman government. Uh, this position had a lot of perks with it. Um, the Pontifex Maximus, for instance, got to take up residence in the building known as the Regia, which legendarily and, and possibly in reality had been the residence of the kings uh, during the time when Rome was part of that larger Etruscan kingdom. Uh, so the Pontifex Maximus, you know, sort of filled the role that uh, religiously that the king had done, according to tradition. Uh, Pontifex Maximus also had a lot of resources. Um, uh, when Julius Caesar, just to give an anecdote about that, when Julius Caesar was exiled during the dictatorship of, uh, of Sulla, something we'll talk about later, he returned to Rome uh, completely broke, and he staked everything on a bid uh, to become Pontifex Maximus, and he managed to win that. Um, and thus, uh, he became fabulously wealthy by milking the resources of the Pontifex Maximus and of his residence in the Regia. Um, and so this could be a, a highly sought-after thing uh, for Roman patricians to achieve. The Pontifex Maximus presided over all of the major festivals. Um, uh, among the important festivals, maybe the, the, the most popular one was known as the Saturnalia, um, which was, uh, and there were harvest festivals and things like this, but the Saturnalia was associated with the winter solstice. It was in December. Uh, it eventually reached a point where it, there were celebrations for about a week. Um, some Roman uh, writers in the Republican period talk about uh, people being so excited about the Saturnalia and so focused on that that they didn't do any work, right? And so this had a function, excuse me, had a function similar to that of, say, Christmas in the Western tradition, right? Where people get so excited about this and uh, the Romans gave gifts during Saturnalia. That seems to be the origin for the uh, custom of gift giving at Christmas, because Christmas ends up adopting a lot of the um, uh, kind of the pagan uh, rituals, um, uh, specifically of the winter solstice or of Saturnalia. In that case, um, there were also rituals uh, for, say, when Rome went to war. There was something called the fetiales uh, that priests would perform. Uh, where they, um, well, they sort of shunted off the responsibility of the Romans that if they were to uh, commit atrocities in the course of the war and defeating their foes, that it wasn't their fault. Uh, it was sort of like winning the favor of the gods uh, to give them sanction to do anything in warfare that they felt was necessary. Um, and so the, uh, the priest in question who was uh, performing the fetiales uh, would take a spear and throw it into the territory of the enemy. Um, and, uh, you know, that that uh, was done, as I said, uh, uh, to, to win the favor of the gods uh, for whatever the Romans needed to do. Uh, the Romans did... Um, now, a couple other things here. Um, I, I mentioned the word, or the term flamen dialis. This was the, um, the chief priest of the cult of Jupiter, and I only mention this because it's just so strange. Uh, the Flamen Dialis was considered, his person was considered completely sacred. Um, and uh, there were lots and lots of prescriptions on the things that the Flamen Dialis could do. Um, he was forbidden, for instance, to, uh, among other things, ride a horse, to eat or even touch raw meat, um, the Flamen Dialis could not, uh, I'm trying to think, um, uh, his fingernails and his, um, 
hair clippings and things like this were kept, uh, were collected carefully. Yes, uh, I should say, lest uh, a part of his body be used to curse him. Uh, the Flamen Dialis could not move in certain parts of the city. Um, he was severely limited in what he could do. Uh, this was not a position that Romans wanted uh, because it meant that, you know, they their ambitions were completely uh, eradicated by the demands of this office, right? There are even instances where uh, Roman patricians would tr try to arrange to get one of their enemies appointed as the Flamen Dialis, uh, which would completely nullify them uh, in the political sphere. Uh, the Romans did practice auguries um, and uh, public ones at that. Uh, you know, they, they had uh, the equivalent, well, they, they had Haros Piques, the, the ones who examined the livers of sacrificed animals. Uh, they had fulgurators, uh, the, the ones who analyzed lightning strikes. Um, uh, they had uh, augurs who would observe the flights of birds, kind of in the Greek tradition or the Greek custom. Um, so they had a, a variety of these, all to determine whether the decisions of the politicians were valid, whether they were backed by the gods, or whether there were ill omens. Um, uh, the most prestigious of the augurs were the Etruscan Haros Piques, because that the, the custom of observing the striations on the livers came from the Etruscans, and so the Romans, uh, if they had some especially dicey situation that they wanted to know the will of the gods, they would seek after a, uh, an Etruscan horospex um, to perform that augury. The Romans, probably this is probably um, part of their very early past, they did at times practice human sacrifice. Not so much as some of the surrounding peoples. The Romans uh, write with horror about um, the Carthaginian practice of uh, human sacrifice where elite Carthaginian families were even expected to give up some of their children to be sacrificed to the gods. Um, and there was a major scandal during the Second Punic War, uh, apparently, where uh, some of the Carthaginian uh, elite families were substituting slave children for their own children when the quotas came out for the, number for the children who had to be sacrificed. And by this, we mean burned alive. I mean, it's really kind of terrible. Not kind of terrible. It's, it's awful to even contemplate. Um, the Romans didn't quite go that far. There are two uh, sort of concepts here or practices uh, that we might mention. Um, uh, so if, Ro if the Romans were faced with a difficult situation that where they just needed the, the favor of the gods, they would do the ultimate, which was to perform a human sacrifice. Um, uh, this was known in Latin as devotio. And that's where we get the word devotion. So remember that next time you use that. If you ever use that word, this is where it comes from. To devote something was to sacrifice it, to kill it, um, uh, to render it not alive. Uh, and, and this could be um, a war captive. Uh, it was common for the Romans, for instance, uh, uh, to sacrifice usually only a few individuals, but... Greeks and Gauls and other people they had captured in wars. Um, uh, but there were instances where uh, commanders of legions would devote themselves. That is, they would plunge headlong into the enemy with the expectation of being killed after appealing to the gods uh, for favor in winning a victory. Right? And sometimes this seemed to have worked to inspire the Roman troops. In other cases, it seems to have backfired on them. There are instances where the Romans devoted enemies, and by that we mean, in the case of Carthage and a few others, entire cities to the gods, and there were rituals that would be part of this as well. Okay, um, So when Carthage was destroyed uh, in, during the Third Punic War, the Romans you know, prayed to the gods to accept the sacrifice, and then they proceeded to devote Carthage uh, and by that we mean kill all of the adult men um, and sell all of the women and children and elderly people into slavery and thus uh, commit what we would call genocide, right? That was seen as a, an act of piety by the Romans. Um, so now that we're all disgusted with this, quite uh, understandably, 
Uh, let's move on to others. Uh, the thing I want you to remember about Pietas is this is this is mostly about rituals and festivals and things like this. And there were key um, individuals uh, within family, within each familia, the Pater Familius, uh, within Roman society in general, people like the Pontifex Maximus and the Flamen Dialis, uh, who would perform these rituals, and they wanted to make sure that these were done properly. That was the main part of their responsibility. Um, we might mention the word gravitas here, and I want to just talk about this very briefly. Gravitas was a virtue... Uh, I should say a value that was ascribed mostly to patricians, uh, especially to august members of the Senate whose uh, opinions were highly respected. Uh, it means something like seriousness. Um, you know, uh, one who had gravitas would be highly respected and relied upon for their ability to make decisions because it was you know, they had a reputation for being for studying things out well and and. Uh, you know, being effective at determining the right course of action, okay? And so this is an important value. Uh, one's reputation was bound up to a great extent with uh, this notion of gravitas. Um, and the most respected individuals in Rome uh, had a lot of this. They were acknowledged for, you know, for, for being um, paragons of, uh, of gravitas. This is closely linked to what I think is the most important of all the Roman values, the one that animated them, uh, at least in um, terms of kind of uh, political ambitions and their public behavior and stuff like this, uh, animated them more than any other. And the Romans use various words for this. Um, we find these used almost interchangeably. They don't really have a lot of... I mean, because this... this idea was so powerful, they had a lot of words for it, right? Um, consider the number of words that, you know, Americans have for freedom or something like that, right? So uh, that these are all used more or less interchangeably, whether we talk, we want to talk about freedom or liberty or uh, anyway, they're, I can't think off the top of my head what some other synonyms are, but they all mean essentially the same thing. Well, dignitas, auctoritas, honos, and others were used we're going to translate all of these with the word honor, um, though we might also use the word reputation. One who had dignitas, or auctoritas, or honos, was a man of good reputation. And this was especially the case for patricians. Patricians lived and died and breathed the currency of honor. That, that's what they sought after. And we've talked a great deal about this already in discussion of uh, the rape of Lucretia and some other things. So I don't want to belabor the point, but let me just go through a few uh, portions of this and, and uh, talk about it a little bit. I also want to look at uh, part of the text of Plautus again, uh, just briefly in association with this. Um, well, the place we see honor uh, to its greatest extent is in you know the uh, kind of the high positions in government. Uh, remember that the uh, the system of magistrates was known as the cursus honorum. That's the the word honos there in the genitive plural. Um, but uh, you know the, it, it was an honor to you know be elected to a high office. It was even more honorable to do something great while in that high office. Um, Cicero, for instance, during his term as consul in the year sixty three BCE. Uh, was faced with uh, a situation in Rome where one of his rival patricians, a guy named Catiline, uh, was starting a rebellion against the city, uh, planning to overthrow it and install himself as dictator, as Sulla had done a generation before him. Um, and uh, Cicero saw this as a great opportunity to win himself greater honor, right? And, and he talks about that at some length. He talks about the honor that he thought he deserved for thwarting this plot to overthrow the Republic. And he was not shameful at all uh, about discussing that and, and actively seeking after it, right? So the Romans, uh, you know, when uh, their Christmas wish list or their Saturnalia wish list would have been uh, a whole bunch of things associated with honor, things that would win them greater honor, opportunities to, uh, you know, to do great deeds. But honor was um, something that passed from generation to generation. In the Senate... The most prominent members, the ones who were respected, the ones who would uh, be appointed as the uh, princeps senatus, 
uh, meaning the kind of the spokesperson or the one who determined the agenda and led the discussion uh, within the Senate, this would be the one who was had the most honor or the most dignitas. Um, and not all senators were the same. And I, I mentioned this already, but uh, you know, some senators, the ones who had the most honor, were the most respected, and their voices were were heard. This is one thing that that uh, Cicero ran up against in the whole Catalinarian conspiracy uh, that I discussed a couple minutes ago. Um, uh, Catiline came from an older, more established family. Cicero was an Ovus Homo, uh, meaning a newly minted patrician, and and uh, you know he ran into that obstacle. Even though the evidence was obvious that Catiline was up to no good, uh, Cicero um, still faced opposition in the Senate uh, that they didn't want to get rid of Catiline. They didn't want to speak out against him because you know his family was old and established and wealthy, and and uh, they'd been around for generations, and and. You simply couldn't replace that kind of honor, especially if your ancestors uh, had done great things. Um, honor came by gaining wealth. It came by doing service. Uh, the Romans embraced the Hellenistic philosophy of Stoicism above all other things, above all other philosophies. Uh, the sense that the universe was governed by uh, by great forces uh, uh, of uh, of gravity and import, and that one had to find one's place within that order of the universe or experience uh, unpleasant things. Um, for the Romans, you know, one of those uh, kind of secure foundations of the world was the Republic. And so Stoic Romans, you know, would sacrifice everything in the service of the Republic. This is another thing that Cicero comments on a lot, and, and we will read some Cicero about Stoicism uh, later in the term. Uh, newly minted patricians were known uh, by the appellation Novus Homo. Uh, here we have the plural of that, um, uh, Novi Homines, uh, you can see right here. Okay. Uh, new man is what that means. A Novus Homo is a new man, meaning a new patrician. Novi Homines were not as respected. They were expected to um, prove themselves in some way. Uh, they were expected to give pride of place to the more honorable patricians within the Senate or within other patrician circles. Um, there are several examples of Novi Homines who accomplished great things, among them Marius and Cicero, um, and also Cato the Elder. Um, but they faced headwinds in doing that, right? Um, and had to uh, probably do twice as much work uh, to win this, you know, to win even uh, a fraction of the honor that those who had been around for a long time and who came from established families had to do. Um, the Romans put a lot of stock in their ancestors. You can see from the, um, uh, from the sculpture here on the slide, this is a, a fairly common thing, that Romans would create busts of their ancestors and have these around. Here we have a Roman patrician holding the busts of his ancestors and uh, all in celebration of their accomplishments. And the Romans had rituals to venerate the ancestors. They appealed to them. Like I said, the, the uh, supernatural world, the world of the deceased was constantly present in their lives. At least that's how they imagined it. Um, and they were expected to carry on the traditions of their ancestors. A great deal of pressure was placed on them. And a lot of the dignitas or the, hon the honos, the honor, was bound up with uh, this legacy of the ancestors. Noble women, um, we might say, were among the more forlorn uh, individuals within Roman society because they were pawns, in large part, of their ambitious fathers and husbands. Um, women were expected to marry uh, for political gain. Um, and in some cases, they were kind of yanked around by their fathers that if they married... Uh, that you know, the, the, their fathers might force them to divorce if a greater marriage prospect um, came open. Uh, and you know, even though women were often celebrated in in uh, funeral in funerary inscriptions and epitaphs um, by their husbands uh, or by their fathers, um, you know, noble women uh, were often kind of um, hapless in their well, in their obedience uh, to the 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 males in their lives, right? Um, and so, you know, we can see these as kind of tragic figures. There are some noble women 
uh, who lashed out and rebelled against their fathers. The most notable of these was um, Julia, the daughter of Augustus Caesar, that you know her father had yanked her chain around so many times that she finally just got sick of it and had a series of high-profile affairs. Um, and her father ended up exiling her away from Rome at one point. Um, and so, you know, noble women were not necessarily, they, they did have privilege, certainly, but they were also expected to do everything they could to keep up the honor of the family. And that meant um, marrying somebody they probably didn't know and or maybe even care for, right? There were some of these arranged marriages that ended up as close, loving relationships. The most prominent of these is the, the daughter of Julius Caesar, also named Julia, uh, with Pompey Magnus, or Pompey the Great, um, which ended up becoming a, a very close, loving relationship, according to all accounts. Um, but when Julia died, that uh, led to the souring of the relationship between Caesar and, and uh, Pompey, and ultimately to the Civil War that we'll talk about later in the term. To gain dignitas, Roman men, especially patrician men, had to have great ambition. They created alliances. They were not above bribery and trying to gain political office or some opportunity to enhance their honor. Um, it was expected that one had to do this, right? The greatest opportunity to win honor came with war. Now, this combination of ambition and the desire to prove oneself in warfare and uh, the desire to gain a client army... Uh, which would which would uh, ensure one's ability to do these things. Uh, we're going to talk about these at great length when we talk about the late Republic next week. Um, and so, you know, keep these values in mind as we discuss that. Okay. Last thing I want to do here is look at another little section of the Plautus. Um, this is the um, speech given by Philolaches, the son, uh, when he first comes in uh, to the scene. And, uh, you know, he talks about, he uses a metaphor for himself, right? Um, he is like a house, okay? When he's born, meaning a, a Roman man, uh, I guess a Greek man in this case, because this is set in Athens, but, uh, you know, we're talking about Roman entertainment here. When he's born, he's like a house, a brand new house, and I will prove it now to all of you that, uh, so that however much you disagree, you will pre presently will see that what I say is absolutely true, right? So we start out with this new pristine house and the builder, you know, tries to build this as strongly as possible. And then, um, you know, then depending on the householder, okay? Now, alas, a worthless fellow moves into this place. Lazy is he, his slaves are lazy too. And to this house, the harm they do is simply a disgrace. A windstorm breaks some tiles, but these he won't replace. The rain comes through and soaks the walls and makes an awful mess. The builder's masterpiece is wrecked, and you really must confess, this is all written in rhyming couplets, it's kind of awkward to read, um, that the builder himself is not to blame, though I really think it's a great big shame when repairs are slight. There are some who will wait till the, cave, till the walls cave in, and it's just too late. That's the metaphor for himself. Then he goes on to say the father is the builder. The father has expectations for his son, he lays his foundations. He tries to teach him. Notice he talks a little bit about education here, right? He teaches him letters and then ancient history and math and law and government and plain geometry. So it'll be a model for the whole community. Um, and uh, the son then is, departs on military service and, and uh, the father monitors him to make sure he's a good soldier and is winning honor there. Um, and, uh, you know, the building well but it's at that point that what this building is going to end up as starts to become clear because and philolakes goes on to say when my father was monitoring me i was a good young man right i did everything that i was supposed to do but when i gained control of myself and took possession of body and soul i ruined oh so fast Right. What caused this? Well, first it was idleness. And then, and with idleness, he lost his modesty. Okay, and became proud and vain. Um, and he didn't make repairs. He didn't change his ways. Then love seeped in. Notice that love is blamed for this. Right? Uh, a young man ought to marry uh, according to his father's wishes to build the family's reputation somehow. 
Um, but this boy falls in love actually with a prostitute, um, and he borrows a lot of money to buy the freedom of this prostitute, and he intends to marry her, and he's gotten her pregnant and all of this, right? Um, and uh, actually, I think I'm conflating these. Um, yeah, this isn't the pregnant one. Sorry, that's in The Women of Andros. Uh, but uh, but uh, anyway, he's, you know, he's bought the freedom of his, uh, of his mistress, um, and he's devoted all of his time and effort to her, um, and notice he says, all is ruined now, my virtue's gone, my name and reputation. And now that we've talked about each of these, you can understand what he's discussing here, right? Virtue, manliness, this isn't sexual morality in this case, it's manliness, um, his manliness has been robbed by things like idleness and, and love, right? Reputation, meaning dignitas, auctoritas, onos. Okay, his honor is taken away and everyone looks down upon him. And then, of course, his father comes back and he has to have a reckoning for all of this. But it's the slave's fault, according to the text, right? Which uh, complicates things a bit here. Um, uh, so, um, anyway, as you try to interpret this, please keep in mind uh, all of these Roman values that we've discussed. I know this has gone on a bit long. Uh, my apologies for that, but there really is not a slide that we will see all semester that is more important, I think, than this one. If you understand these things, you will be able to make sense of Romans pretty well. Okay? All right, so we will move on um, next time and start to talk about uh, Roman conquests. Um, of uh, other territories in the Mediterranean.